2 Timothy chapter number 4. We'll begin reading verse number 1. The Apostle Paul, giving some final instruction to Timothy, young pastor, he had won to the Lord, he trained in the ministry. The Apostle Paul in this chapter will give his final epitaph before he is about to be led out and beheaded. He will be found guilty of being a Christian. But just before he goes off into glory, his heart is revealed to this young preacher. This is what Paul says. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for the good singing. Thank you, Lord, we can be in church tonight. Thank you, Father, for uh, a church still contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Thank you for the truths contained in the Bible. Thank you, Lord, that you never change. And thank you, Lord, that we can come and we can assemble with your people and we can worship you tonight in spirit and in truth. Now, Father, I pray you help us the next few minutes. Lord, I pray you touch my throat. I'm reminded the Apostle Paul said, When I'm weak, then am I strong. And we come tonight not leaning on our own understanding tonight, but Father, we come trusting in Thee to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Now, Father, help us enlighten our minds to truth. God, educate us tonight, edify us, instruct us in the ways of righteousness and holiness, and God certainly... Help us to be seated in heavenly places. Help us not take for granted the truths that will be uh, expounded upon tonight. For you said, where much is given, much is required. And Father, help us to take these truths and to change some sinner's world by introducing them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us tonight. We'll bless you for it. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now I want to... As I always do, I believe when you read a text, you ought to expound the text. Uh, a lot of preaching today, and you'll hear some things over the next few weeks about a lot of today's whatever. But a lot of preaching today uses the Bible just as a springboard to bring out some kind of thought they want to bring. Uh, but Paul says right here to preach the Word. And I'm a very big proponent on expounding the text. And every time you hear me preach, I'm going to tell you what the text we just read says, and then we'll utilize that text to get to a thought or theme uh, from that text. And so I want you to notice that Paul is charging Timothy three things in these verses. He charges him, first of all, to preach the Word. He didn't say, preach ideology. He didn't say preach philosophy. He didn't say preach uh, your opinions. He said preach the Word. The Bible says, So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. The Bible says that we're bought, bought, uh, begotten by an incorruptible seed, the Word of God. The Word of God is what will separate uh, fact from fiction. The Word of God is the only thing that will, is forever settled in heaven. And my dear friends, the Word of God, when heaven and earth is passed away, you can still stand on it. And so he said, preach the Word. If there's any indictment against uh, our age, it's how little people adhere to the Word of God. Your best friend, my dear friends, is that book in your lap, the Word of God. It will help you today tomorrow and for all of eternity. 
The Apostle Paul knew this. He's telling uh, young Timothy, he said, above all other things, preach the word. So we see that charge. He also charges Timothy to be persistent. He said in verse 2, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. He says you need to be persistent. You can't be wishy washy. We just enjoyed that wonderful song that talks about the Lord never changes. You know who else ought not to change? God's people. We need to be persistent. Now, as we get into this study, uh, I will let you know as we stand here tonight that there are some 50 Baptist denominations in America. I like a, a, a periodical I get every now and then out of Arizona. It says, remember what Baptists once were? We still are. We need to be persistent. The Word of God doesn't change with the times. The times should change because of the Word of God. And God's people shouldn't change with the times uh, because our Savior still sits on the throne tonight. You need to be persistent. You need to preach the Word. But then he tells Timothy to persevere. Look what he says in verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. He said, Timothy, you're going to have to persevere. He says there are folks who are going to turn their ears away from the truth. They're going to heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they're going to want people to tell them how good they are. They're going to want people to tell them that everything's okay when things aren't okay. They're going to want people to tell them that they can still live in their sin and go to heaven. Said, uh, 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 they're going to come up with all kinds of different denominations and religions. He said, you just persevere. Can I help you with something? It's not popular being right, but it's always right to be right. Now, in this passage we find in verse number 3 it says for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine doctrine is mentioned 55 times in scripture doctrine simply means the study of the bible the study of the scriptures now people are scared to death when you mention the word doctrine because they are not indoctrinated into truth if you know the truth, you're not afraid of anything. Of the 55 times doctrine is mentioned in Scripture, 13 times you'll find it in the books of First and Second Timothy. 13 is the number of rebellion. The 13th and final time you find it mentioned in Second Timothy, you find it right here in verse number 3 where it says, They will not endure sound doctrine. The 13th time you find them rebelling from sound doctrine. As we sit here tonight, there are some 300 different religions and denominations in America. 300. And my dear friends, they can't all be right. So, we will be looking the next few weeks at Baptist distinctives and what Baptists believe and where Baptists came from and why we are Baptist. And we will say some things that may upset, may offend. But can I say Baptists have never been one who sought to offend, but they've often been found offensive. You see, Jesus said this. He said that, when he came, he didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Doctrine divides. As a matter of fact, I believe it was John said, they were not all of us, for if they had been of us, they would not have left us. Can I say this, that 
of the 300 different religions and denominations, and let's just deal with the denomination aspect of it, they all branched off or came about or were formed because they did not agree with the Baptists. You're welcome. That didn't cost you anything. We'll show you tonight there's only one church you can trace back to Jesus. It's the Baptist church. And we'll show you tonight that Baptist is not a denomination. Matter of fact, I'll just go ahead and throw this out to you. This will get you real good and offended to start. Denomination is an abomination. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, there's one faith, one Lord, one baptism. One. Jesus started one church. So where did the 300 come from? Well, it wasn't from Jesus. Now just play the devil's advocate tonight. advocate tonight. If you wanted to damn people to hell, wouldn't you make religion confusing? Yet 1 Corinthians 14 tells us God is not the author of confusion. Hmm? John 8, Jesus said the devil was, the, was a liar and the father of it. Can I say, going back to Genesis 3, you find that Satan distorted the word of God and deceived Eve, and that's why we're in the problem we're in tonight. He's always just distorted it a little bit, and then it progresses. So, let me give you a few things about the Baptist faith. There is a distinction in the Baptist faith. First of all, it lies within its founder. The founder of the Baptist faith is Jesus Christ Himself. I will show you not all 300, because we'll be here forever, but I will show you where the other denominations came from. They were started by man. If I'm basing my soul on something that's going to take me to heaven, I want something based on something the Lord started. Hmm? Can I say the distinction of the Baptist faith lies in its foundational truths? And the distinction of the Baptist faith also lies in its fundamentals. Now, a lot of people think that the Baptist faith is the no, no fun religion. I'm going to tell you something. I've been saved 47 years. I'm having the time of my life. If I'm not having fun, don't tell me, okay? Hmm? There's just something about having the peace of God in your soul. Uh, now, what separates Baptists from all others, first of all, is her authority. Independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptists take all of their doctrine directly from the Scriptures. Let me qualify that right now. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In order to understand doctrine, you have to understand that over in Deuteronomy there was the law of witness. And in order to be a, a witness in a court of law, in order for a foundational truth, Brother Donald, to be established, there had to be two or three witnesses. I couldn't come to uh, uh, and bring you to court and accuse you of something without two or three witnesses. That foundation is passed throughout Scripture. You see, in order for something to be a doctrine rightly divided, Brother Brian, you have to find it written in the same context to the same people at least two times. Most of the time you'll find it three times in Scripture. You have to have two or three witnesses whether or not it is a true doctrine of the Scriptures. This is very important. The reason we've gotten to 300 different religions and denominations, a lot of them will take one verse out of context and build a whole doctrine on it. In order to find the context of a verse, you've got to read the chapter before the chapter it's written in, the chapter that it's in, and the chapter afterwards. That way you'll figure out who it's writing to. Then you'll have to look in the context and see what it's writing about. And then you'll have to go find it written to the same people in the same context somewhere else in order for it to be a doctrine. You see, that takes work. 
and people are lazy. We'd rather just take something for face value rather than to research it and see what it really says. Kind of reminds me of today's society. Rather than read and find out what's really going on, we'll listen to what the corporate heads tell us on the news and take it for, for the gospel. <clears throat> All of our doctrine is taken from Scripture, rightly divided. Can I say no one else does that? Can I say Southern Baptists don't do that? They have a corporate head in Nashville. Can I say every denominational church has a corporate head? And the corporation or the corporate head, they're the ones that determine what you will believe. Not us. Independent Baptists, we take what Jesus says as to what we will believe. Not only are we separated by our authority, the Scriptures, we're separated also by autonomy. We are self-governing. We don't have a corporate head. See, we believe the Bible. Jesus is the head of the church. He is the lawgiver. It's His church. He loved the church and gave Himself for it. And we have Him as the head and we are His body. And can I say the uh, blueprint for the local church is the church of the wilderness. You had God who spoke to Moses, His man, and then Moses would come and speak to the people. When they did what God said, God blessed. When they rebelled against Moses, or rebelled about, well, against what God said, then judgment came. Can I say, in the local church, uh, the Lord has a man. He has a pastor. He has an under-shepherd. The Lord's the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, the great shepherd. But He has an under-shepherd. And when God's man's in tune with God, and God speaks to God's man, and God's man stands up and says, Thus saith the Lord, and people do what God says, God blesses. When they rebel, God judges. But we are self-governing. We don't worry about what some church is doing down the street. That's between them and God. We don't care about a corporate head because we don't have one. We have the head, the Lord Jesus. We are self-governing. That's why I really didn't care what Andy said. <clears throat> huh? And I really don't care what he said when I found out he said that Christians are ignorant. At the judgment seat, when he sees us in the jury and he's at the great white throne judgment, he'll rethink all that. But that's another, another message. I'm not going to get into that. What also separates Baptists from others is not only our authority and our autonomy, but our assembly. We do more than just come together to have a service. When we assemble, we are making a statement to the world that we are a, of a peculiar people, a royal generation. And as being members of this local assembly, our very assembling together is surrendering our own rights and freedoms of one another to one another that we become accountable one to another. And most people don't look at it that way. You see, we've been bought with a price. Our life is no longer our own. When we come together, we come together as the body of Christ. It's not big eyes and little U's. We're all one in Christ. We have no individual identity. Our identity is Christ. That separates us from all others. There are three important defining areas of the Baptist faith. Number one, it's faith, what we believe. And we'll be discussing that. Second of all is order, what we do, how we practice what we believe. And the third thing is connection, where we came from. What's our history? You know what's sad? I look at these kids. These kids, unless mom and dad does a little work, they're not going to know what history really is in America. It amazes me as we sit here right now, there is a whole sect of America that is proclaiming we have a president-elect. i got news for you, there's no such title. Can I help you with something? I know we voted last week, but the ballots haven't been cast for the president yet, and they won't till the first week of December. And just a 
little minor history lesson. Gore versus Bush, it wasn't settled for 37 days. But see, we don't teach history, we don't teach civics anymore. So these kids have no idea about history. They have no idea, and by the way, Brother Charlie, thank you for being a veteran. Thank you for your service. They have no idea why men like him stood opposed, why they served our country so we could have the freedom of what we did last week. And it ought to upset you to no end that this country has gone so south that they don't even care about all the fraud that is being brought out, even as we sit here tonight. Hmm? If we have no free election in America, we have no America. You do know that, don't you? Huh? Well, I say all that to say this. Our history as a nation is very important. I believe in history. I loved history. I love American history. But can I say something? I love our Baptist history. Persecution in this world has been something that has been around for generations. There's been a lot of people persecuted. Can I say... In America, America is stained with persecution. America persecuted the Native American Indian and still does. Hmm? America persecuted the black man and still does. Today, America persecutes if you're white and free thinking. But can I say, persecution's always been. The Jews have been greatly persecuted throughout the world. And even in America today, the left persecutes them. Do you realize more Jews voted Republican this time than in the history of our country? Because they saw the light. Hmm? Now we know the Jews have often been persecuted because they're God's chosen people. But can I say tonight that one other sect that most people don't even give any consideration to are the Baptists. You know, outside the Jews, the Baptists have been persecuted more than any other group of people in the history of mankind. The Dark Ages was a 1,200-year period they estimated in that 1,200 years, some nearly 10 million Baptists were slaughtered for their faith. You don't hear much about them because when they were slaughtered, so were their history books. They were burnt and destroyed. Matter of fact, the church that we have tonight is here on the blood of people that gave their lives that we could have the truths that we hold so dear and the freedom to worship. That's why when Andy says we're non-essential, Andy has no idea what people have went through that we could come here tonight. <clears throat> 1 Timothy 3.15 says this, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar of and ground of the truth. The church of God, the pillar and ground of the truth. In your King James Bible, you'll find the word church mentioned 115 times in the New Testament. Of those 115 times, 114 times, it is dealing with the local called out assembly. The Greek word is ecclesia. Can I say, when Jesus is referring to the church, the pillar and ground of the truth, Brother Donald, He's dealing with local, visible, New Testament 
called out body of believers. This is very important. Of the false denominations and teachings out there, they teach that the church is universal. Matter of fact, that's a very important term, universal. That's what the name Catholic means. Universal. Jesus didn't die for a universal church. He died for a local church, a visible church. We can't preach to spirits and a group of folks out there somewhere. We have a local assembly, a called out assembly of believers. It's so, so very important. There is, the, there is a difference between the church and the family of God. A lot of people that do not rightly divide the Scriptures want to refer to as the family of God as the church. That's not true. That's not a biblical statement. Mm, there are folks that are saved in other churches that are part of the family of God. But as concerning us and the Lord, we're interested in this local church. That's the only thing we have to deal with. We don't deal with others. We're not interested in the family of God. We're interested in the church the pillar and ground of the truth. It was very important. Uh, listen, I want to start this study tonight on this thought. Baptist distinctives, the church. The church. Because this is so misunderstood what the church is. Let me qualify this, Brother Phil, by saying not everything that calls itself a church is the church. The church is very important. Now, over the next few weeks in our study in the church, I don't know how far we'll get to tonight, but I'll give you the ideals of where we're going. We're going to deal with the origin of the church. We're going to deal with the officers of the church. We're going to deal with the ordinances of the church. We're going to deal with the offerings of the church. We're going to deal with the objective of the church. And then we're going to deal with our obligation to the church. It's all very important. But tonight, let's look at the origin of the church. Where did church come from? How did she start? When did she start? How long has she been here? Mm, let me just help you right now. The church isn't going down, she's going up. All right? So let's deal with the origin of the church. In Matthew chapter number 10, verse number 5, the Bible says this. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Matthew chapter number 10, we find Jesus calls his twelve disciples. And he sends them forth, two by two, preaching, the gospel of the kingdom. Can I say that the church was started by Jesus in His earthly ministry. He was the chief cornerstone. Can I say this? The church was started by Him, and here we see that He is sending them forth to preach the gospel. It's so important. In Matthew chapter 16, He asked... Uh, his disciples, who does men say that I am? And they start saying, some say Jeremiah, some say Elias. Some. And then he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the son of the living God. And he told him, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood didn't reveal this unto thee, but my father. Now this is what he says in Matthew 16, 18. This is a hallmark verse. If you don't get anything else tonight, get this verse. The Bible says, and I say also unto thee, this is Jesus talking to Peter, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is a hallmark verse, and it's a misunderstood verse. You have to understand, when you're studying Scripture, punctuation. Yeah, everybody remember English class? Remember diagramming sentences? Hated it. Huh? Hated it. All them adverbs and adjectives, and all what a colon meant, a semicolon... You know what, though? I love it today. Because now I can understand the Bible because I understand punctuation. Now, let me read that verse to you again, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to 
kind of illustrate it for you. Jesus is talking to Peter. He says, Thou art Peter. Stand up, Donald. You ain't done nothing all night. Stand up. He says, Thou art Peter. That's what he said. Thou art Peter. Then, there's a little comma. Then it says, And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He didn't say, Thou art Peter, and upon that rock I'm going to build my church. Peter means little stone. He said, Thou art Peter, comma, and upon this rock, the rock of ages, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Thank you, you can sit down. The church was built upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the chief cornerstone. He was the one that the non-believing Pharisees stumbled at His appearance. They did not believe on Him, but He's the one that He built the church upon. Can I say this? The church was started in Matthew 10. It was not started in Acts chapter 2. You have a whole set of denominations, including Southern Baptists, that believe the church started at Pentecost. Hogwash. The Bible tells us in Acts uh, uh, chapter 2 that the Lord's uh, added to the church daily such as should be saved. In that chapter, 3,000 souls were added to the church. How can you add something to something that did not exist? In Acts chapter 1, you find 120 in the upper room praying and seeking after God. Who were they? They were the early church. Huh? Can I say this? Jesus started the church in His earthly ministry. He paid for the church at Calvary. He resurrected. He commissioned the church in Matthew 28. And then we find in Acts chapter number 2, He empowered the church by the Holy Ghost coming, the Comforter, and He empowered them to be witnesses under Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the world. Now, it's very important to understand something about what Jesus said when He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There's a doctrine that a lot of Baptists no longer preach, meaning or called the perpetuity of the church. Let me look at the Ellis's back here. Y'all look like Quakers. What's the deal? We got Mama Ellis and Papa Ellis and the three bears. Huh? Now the three bears came about from Mama and Papa Ellis. Daniel didn't decide one day he wanted to be an Ellis and just jumped into the family. He was born into the family. It takes a mom and a daddy to produce a child. Can I say it takes a church to birth a church? There are a lot of so-called churches where some folks get mad at the preacher, so they'll leave and they'll go down the street somewhere and decide that they're going to start their own church, and they start their own church, and then nothing ever happens to it. Why? Well... It's what is referred to as a bastard church. It didn't have a proper start. It takes a church to birth a church. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There's always been a remnant of the church since Jesus went back to glory. And there will be till he comes back after his church. Now can I say something about bastard churches? Can I say... 99% of the time they're built on anything but preaching. Oh, they'll have a preacher, but it's not built on preaching. It's built on singing. It's built on programs. It's built on entertainment. It's built on uh, uh, doing good works. It's built on all kinds of things, but it's not built on preaching. What did I tell you to separate us from everybody else? The book. It takes a church to birth a church. There are a lot of churches that never amount to anything because they weren't started right. So, so important. Our church was started by Emmanuel Baptist Church out of Dayton, Kentucky. 
It was started out of another Baptist church. And you can just keep tracing it back. Can I say there are churches that start churches? That's the Bible way. Our church here started Dearborn Baptist Church over in Dearborn, Indiana. That's the Bible way to start churches. Churches starting churches. That's the Bible way. Any other way is not the Bible way. And if it's not the Bible way, we shouldn't be interested in it. So we see our church was founded by Jesus in his earthly ministry. Now let me give you a few things, and then we'll give you some history here. The church is not an organization. It is a living organism. Jesus is alive. He has the keys to death and hell, and he's alive forevermore. He is the head. We are his body. It is a living organism. The reason that society can say we're non-essential, they're looking at an organization, and a lot of them are non-essential. But we are a living organism. Can I say this? The name Baptist was given by God. You'll find it in Matthew 3, verse number 1. John was called John the Baptist. By the way, when God named him that, he hadn't baptized anybody. It didn't say John the Baptizer. He was John the Baptist. Ours is a biblical name. That's very important. Okay? Can I say this? And denominations are an abomination because they were denominated to be whatever they are. We weren't denominated by anybody as to what we were. God named us. And can I say something else? There are a lot of t churches today call themselves Baptistic. Well, the term Baptistic means like a Baptist. I'm not like a Baptist. I am a Baptist. The book of Jude said this in verse number 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now, I'd be remiss if I did not mention that the church hasn't always been called the Baptist church. But the very doctrine that we preach and adhere to today has been preached and adhered to since the apostles. It's the faith which was once delivered unto the saints by Jesus himself. <clears throat> early on in the early church, the church was called by the town that the church was found in. You'll find them in your Bible. The church at Ephesus, the church at Galatia, the church at Corinth, the church at Thessalonica. You get the examples? They were called by the city that the church was found in. In the first century church, as the gospel started being preached around the world, many times they were called by the preacher that came through and preached. They said his doctrine, they called themselves by his name. But again, the preaching has always been the same. The faith has always been the same. Can I say this? The church has been called monetist. The church has been called nobatist. Donatist, Paulicians, after the Apostle Paul, uh, Albingenses, the Waldenses, the Arnoldses, uh, the Henricians, and the Anabaptists. They were called Anabaptists because when somebody was converted, they would rebaptize them. You say, why would they have to rebaptize them? Because they were converted out of Catholicism where they baptized infants. Now, a minute ago, I said that Baptists, some 10 million were slaughtered. Two reasons our Baptist forefathers were slaughtered. Because we would not adhere to infant baptism. Acts tells us, See, here is water. What does hinder me from being baptized? That thou believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. How can an infant believe on the Lord? You don't get baptized until after you get saved. The second thing, and we'll get into this in our study, is something called soul liberty, and most Baptists don't even adhere to it anymore. So 
So we'll look at soul liberty. And we'll look at baptism when we get to the ordinances of the church. Now listen. The world will tell you you're either Catholic or you're Protestant. No, we're neither. We're Baptists. We were here before both. You see, Protestants came out of the Reformation period. John Calvin and Martin Luther, who were Catholics, got to studying the Scriptures and realized they were taught wrong, so they started the Reformation. They unaligned with the Catholic Church and started religions. Out of that, denominations came. So they'll say that if you're not Catholic, you protested the Catholic faith and you came out of the Catholic faith. No. We've been here before the Catholic faith. In Acts chapter number 10, you'll find the story where Peter sees a dream. In the dream, there's a sheet of all kinds of animals, and the Lord tells him to rise and eat. He said, not so, because there were certain animals that was unclean. They weren't to eat under the law. They weren't allowed to eat hog like us. Hmm? Three times he had the dream. All three times he argued with the Lord. Imagine that, Peter arguing with the Lord. He wakes from his dreams. There's a knock on the door. Two servants from a, a, a Grecian by the name of Cornelius came and said, uh, our master wants you to come preach to him. So Peter goes and he preaches to Cornelius, who's a Grecian, a Gentile. He believes, and so does the whole house, and the Holy Ghost falls on them just like he'd done to the Jews. And it marveled Peter. Now he realized what the, the message was, is you can take the gospel to anybody. Now, Cornelius, his household, leaves Jerusalem, goes back to Greece. Okay? He heard one message and got born again. One message. He goes back to Greece. He starts telling the message in Greece, and it goes on over into Rome, and they start hearing the message about how Jesus Christ came and died on the cross, shed His blood, and whosoever believe on Him could be born again from their sins. Well, if we started a little study here tonight, and I whispered in Fred's ear something, and he whispered in Aiden's ear, and Aiden whispered into Owen's ear, and Owen told Jackie, and we went all around the room. By the time we got over here to Donald, the story would change immensely. And that would be in a minute of, in a span of 15 minutes. They heard one message from Peter. In 321 A.D. at the Council of Trent, Constantine wanted a state-sponsored religion. You see, Rome was pagan. And Rome embraced paganism and the one message of Cornelius and developed a religion. 321 A.D. called Catholicism. They say Peter was the first pope because Peter preached to Cornelius. If Peter had been the first pope, he'd have had to nearly be 400 years old. But you see, for those 321 years, there had been a group of Christians preaching the gospel around the world. We didn't come out of the Catholic Church. They took our message and corrupted it and formed their own religion. <clears throat> Let me give you where some of the denominations came from. Again, Catholicism came from Constantine. Our faith came from Jesus Christ. The Lutherans came from Martin Luther in 1536. 1536. We've been around 1,500 years. The Episcopalians came from Fletcher in 1578. The Methodists, Miss Janet, came from Wesley, 1729. The Church of Christ came from Campbell in 1807. They believe you can't be saved unless you're baptized. What do you do with the thief on the cross? And what did they do for 1,800 years before then? Before Campbell got enlightened, huh? 
The Presbyterians came from John Calvin in 1509. It amazes me how many Baptists are Calvinists, and Calvin was a reformer. Uh, the Nazarenes came about in 1909 as a split off the Methodist Church. The Church of God movement started by the Tomlinson family out of Cleveland, Tennessee in 1900. It's amazing. In 1900, amazing thing. 1900 is the first time that a false Bible was printed in America. 1900 is when the Church of God movement started in America. And 1900 is the first time somebody spoke in tongues in America. There's a coalition. Hmm. In 1909, the apostolic faith was started by a woman, Florence Crawford. What a blessing. Huh? And every other denomination has been started from those denominations. Of the 300 different denominations and religions in America, the vast majority are less than 125 years old. Yet your Baptist faith goes back 2,000 years to Jesus Christ. Now listen. Let me give you some quotes. It's one thing for me to tell you that we've been around. Let, let you hear from others. Cardinal Hoseas of the Council of Trent in 1527 said this, Were it not that the Baptists had been grievously tormented and cut off with the knife the last 1,200 years, they would swarm in greater numbers than all the Reformers. Sir Isaac Newton said, The Baptists are the only body of known Christians that have never symbolized with Rome. The historian Mosheim said this, Before the rise of Luther and Calvin, there lay secreted in almost all the countries of Europe persons who adhered tenaciously with Baptists. The Edinburgh Encyclopedia out of Scotland said this, It must have already occurred to our readers that the Baptists are the same sect of Christians that were formerly described as Anabaptists. Indeed, this seems to have been their leading principle from the time of Tertullian to present time. Now, Tertullian was born 50 years after the death of John the Apostle. So they can take us all the way back to the Apostles, friend. We've been there. The Baptist faith is a faith that has been secured by blood. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and the blood of the martyrs who gave their lives rather than submit to tyrants, to religions, to philosophies. If you've never read the book of Fox's Book of Martyrs, I highly recommend it. You'll read where they would take a man's wife and children and tie them to a stake and say, we're going to set them on fire unless you recant in Jesus Christ. And then he'd look at them and apologize. I said, I just can't do it. And they'd set his wife and children on fire and he'd watch them burn. And they'd go out into eternity singing songs like Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. You say, what, what propelled people to do that? Something that's real. You see, we are blessed to be the recipients of something so grand. The Bible says where much is given, much is required. We have been given all the blessings that they paid for. You say, well, I'd give my life for Jesus. Well, that's easy to say when... You was afraid of coronavirus. Little Andy tell you you can't come to church. You won't come to church. Hmm? You see, we've been given this privilege not to die for Christ, but to live for Him. To show others there is a difference. Can I say... The second emotion associated with the church is not only the blood, but love. Baptists have been persecuted. And the whole time they were persecuted, they loved their persecutors. 
and they would tell them the truth. We even know the Apostle Paul when he was arrested in Rome won some of Caesar's own household. He loved those that even sought to kill him. What can I say? And being a Baptist comes great responsibility. We can be lazy and ignore our heritage, ignore the scriptures, just come and enjoy services and think, boy, this is great. Or we can be responsible. What hope do they have if we don't carry on? the truth I shudder to think what America is going to be like in 30 years I know I'm old but I remember if you called somebody a communist I mean that was a bad name now you got half of a party that wants to embrace it and nobody seems to care What is America going to look like in 30 years? But what is the church going to look like in 30 years? I look at the last 30 years and I can't believe we are where we are tonight. So many people are being deceived. So many people, good people, moral people, people that are compassionate and that care and that want to do right. They've been deceived. Now we can do one of two things. We can show them the truth. And we can love them. And have compassion on them. Or we can beat our chest and think, boy, we're something. Paul said it best. He said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. We're nothing outside the grace of God. It's only by the grace of God we have been exposed to the Scriptures and to truth. We've been shown the right way of salvation. You see, every major world war has been fought over baptism and Christianity. Even though we don't like to think in those realms. You know why most of the Middle East hates America? Because we're Christian. As a nation, we claim to be Christian. And we line up with Israel. They hate us for it. Do you realize there are people who hate you for coming to church tonight and not wearing a mask? You are a terrorist. It's been said. All you do is love Jesus. You try to get the gospel around the world so others can know Jesus, but you're a terrorist. I've watched. People are drinking the Kool-Aid. I was driving up 42 today. Saw a young lady walking down 42, nobody within two miles of her wearing a mask outside. I'm thinking, are you a nut? So, well, she's going to get it. I got news for you. 85% of people getting corona wear masks regularly. The mask will not protect you. You know what it'll do? It'll make your nose run while you're wearing it. Huh? I don't know where I contracted it. I don't know if I got it in Florida. I don't know if I got it with somebody giving me change back from something. I don't know if I got it somebody breathing on me. I don't know if I got it in the airport. I don't know if I got it in a rental car. I don't know if I got it on the airplane. I don't know if I got it at the funeral home where I do a little funeral work. Three people at the funeral home had it. I don't know if I got it there. I don't know. But I will tell you this. When I went to Florida, on the airplane I wore a mask. When I was in the airport I wore a mask. When I was around people I wore a mask. And I got it. Huh? But yet... We're going to shut the country down and everybody must wear a mask. 
dumb. But people are drinking the Kool-Aid because there are two things people are afraid of. Death and their safety being taken away. So if I can still be safe, I'll do whatever you say. Can I say the umbrella's fallen in religion? As long as you tell me I get to go to heaven when I die, I'll listen to whatever you say. And people have drank the Kool-Aid. And there are going to be many good people die and go to hell because they rejected Jesus Christ. So well, I was religious, but you were lost. You didn't trust in Christ. Listen, being a Baptist won't take you to heaven. Hmm? Won't. A lot of Baptists are going to die and go to hell because they're trusting in being a Baptist rather than trusting in Jesus Christ. Right. <clears throat> in the weeks to come, we'll continue dealing with what it takes to be a Baptist deal with church membership we'll deal with the bride of Christ a lot of people got that messed up we'll deal with the ordinances what baptism really means what the Lord's Supper really means we'll deal with those things we'll deal with all these truths again not so we can beat our chest and say we're Baptists we're right so that you know why you're Baptist. And then you'll be able to take some of these truths and help somebody else. A lot of people misled. A lot of good people in denominations that have no idea why they're in that denomination other than, well, that's the way I was born. That's the way I was raised. Listen, both my parents smoked cigarettes. I was raised around cigarettes. But I don't smoke cigarettes. Why? Because I realized there wasn't nothing good in that. Hmm? Just because you was raised around something doesn't mean you have to embrace it. Hmm? So it's important to understand. We're distinctive in being Baptist. It starts where we came from. We came from the Lord. And I got good news for him. He's coming back for his church. And one of these days, and I believe soon, and I promise you, if this thing, if all this fraud isn't overturned, by the way, North Carolina, it's already in Trump's corner. By the way, Pennsylvania and Michigan got pulled from Biden today. Uh, it's, all, it's all headed the right direction. But if Biden does get, you know, the crown, hallelujah, Jesus is coming sooner. I guarantee you that. But regardless of who's in the White House, Jesus is on the throne. So I'm just going to live in that. Because it'll be all right. Amen. All right, we'll stop there tonight. <clears throat> I tell you what, I know this was more of a teaching message. Teaching imparts information. Preaching requires a decision. But I never like to have church and not give an opportunity for folks to pray if they don't want to come and pray. Maybe you want to come and pray about our country. Maybe you want to come and pray for folks that you know that are good people, they've just been misled. Maybe tonight you just want to come and thank God that, hey, you know the truth and you have the scriptures. I don't know. So Brother Clint, come pick something out. Oh, well, never mind, Clint. We got Miss Renee here. Miss Renee, come play something. And uh, some folks are already coming to pray. And let's just pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for truth. But Lord, we're responsible for it. Lord, I appreciate those that gave their lives that we could have the truth. I appreciate, Lord, the faculties to be able to understand the truth. I appreciate your kindness and mercy towards us, Father. Lord, help us to take truth and share it with a lost and dying and confused world. Help them to know there is a better way, and His name is Jesus. He can change their life. They don't have to live in fear or confusion. Lord, thank You for the faith of the Son of the living God. 
Now bless now as these folks are praying. You know what they're seeking you for. Just speak to hearts and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.